also, um, I actually collected ElfQuest ages ago when I was a kid. Totally into comic books, still into comic books. And so when I heard that the series was still going on after all this time, I was like, that's so awesome. So, um, what do you think is the enduring quality that has allowed this series to go on for 40 years? 40 years this year. 2018 is our 40th anniversary. And to answer your question, well, there's a word that has been overused through the years, but it's appropriate here and it's relevance. ElfQuest speaks to individual readers as readers and human beings and people with hearts and souls in a very, very realistic way. It's not superheroes, it's not outer space, it's characters who happen to look like elves and they're four feet tall and they have pointed ears, but at the same time, they have problems to solve that are exactly the same as the problems that look around at the world as it is today, dealing with phobias, and, and uh, people trying to divide groups of people instead of bringing them together. And ElfQuest is all about inclusivity, and it always has been. Um, Wendy is the master storyteller. She's been telling stories about characters trying to find family and tribe all her life, and ElfQuest is the sort of diamond standard distillation of the, all those stories. And Elf, that's, go ahead. Okay. Elfquest was born in the mid-70s, almost the same time Star Wars was born. And that was an era of excitement and hope. It was certainly an era of political unrest and uh, people protesting what they felt were the ills of society and Richard and I wrote and drew about what we cared about in the world and we used our characters as fantasy metaphors to talk about the human condition and we always have for 40 years and when a fan communicates with us and lets us know that they were able to solve a problem in their life because they saw what one of our characters did with a similar problem. It's really, really gratifying because it means the fans have always and continue to find themselves in the characters. And they, they have so many characters in ElfQuest to choose from, to identify with. And I think it's because of that that ElfQuest is what our publisher calls evergreen. Absolutely. Um, I found um, an early ElfQuest comic book, and I was flipping through it again. It was from, I think, 87. I've got it here. Um, and I thought the cool thing about it was that you had a letter in there, and at the end you're like, hey, send us your questions, comments. And then you had a letter at the end where you were kind of talking about stuff. I can show it to you. You mean editorials? Yeah. Oh, yeah. In the oh, comic book. Oh, yeah, itself. editorials. You Not, know, we, we don't write fan letters to ourselves. Yeah, no, no, no. No, no. those are very <laughs> private. Those are. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we're awesome. Um, but I just thought it was cool where it was like, hey, here's an address. You know, send us your thoughts, tell us mm -hmm. what you think. And it was from both of you. Well, back we, then there was no such thing as the internet, and the only way you could get feedback on your intellectual property was through the mail. And we both came up loving comics in the 1960s. And in a lot of those comics, particularly Marvel, if you got a letter printed, they also printed the address, your, your, your mailing address. That's how I met her, mm -hmm. through the comics. But we always felt that that was such a friendly thing to do on the part of the publisher, on the part of Marvel and DC particularly. We wanted to establish that sense of connection ourselves with our readers 
through ElfQuest. Mm -hmm. So we were always asking for letters. We were always happy to get really great letters. And we were always happy to interact and answer letters if we chose to print them. Um, that spirit continues today. Of course, very few people actually write letters on paper. But um, we have a big social media presence. There's uh, an ElfQuest fan group on Facebook that has thousands and thousands of members. And we go there, we interact. Uh, sometimes we correct somebody who's got a wrong impression or if somebody has a good question, we'll pipe up and answer it. But we have always liked that sense of community. There's that word again with uh, the fans. Yeah, and when I was collecting comics around that time, there was a lot of, I guess what you call more independent titles, but it did feel more like family, community, you know, but almost self-publishing as opposed to like a big conglomerate kind of thing. Well, yeah, it, w it wasn't an underground comic, and it wasn't mainstream, so the term ground level comic uh, sort of came out of the early 80s, I think. And uh, we were identified as that for, for quite some time. Plus, at the time ElfQuest started, the field was wide open. Because you had Marvel, you had DC, you had Archie. And that was it for comics. But the direct market was just coming into its own in the late 1970s and early 1980s. And they were hungry for new and different material. ElfQuest helped fill that vacuum really, really nicely. Um, there's just as much, if not more, independent creativity being exhibited today on the, the web, on the internet. But there's so much. It's so far-reaching that you have to want to put your voice out there very, very loudly and strongly to get attention now. Back then we didn't have to work at it because we were about all there was. And we're thankful every day that we started ElfQuest 40 years ago instead of now. We would not be able to do what we have done. Right. Um, at that time, I was collecting all sorts of stuff like Cerberus and Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. And actually, you wrote in your article they were just starting to come around, Ninja Turtles. You know, and nowadays there's the movies, TV shows, toys, action figures. What's your take on that? Because back then you're kind of like, I don't know about this. Oh, heavens. Um, <laughs> you know, the Turtles happened, I think they started up in the mid-1980s. And they were a bombshell phenomenon the way ElfQuest had been in the late 1970s. Um, something very quirky about the Turtles, it was, it was ripe for a TV show and then movies. ElfQuest, we're still fine-tuning that because ElfQuest is a very, very complex, subtle kind of story and it's an ongoing thing. We've been doing it 40 years, telling one continuous story. In terms of how we felt about it then, I'm pretty sure we didn't feel that, oh, well, that's inappropriate or that there's anything wrong with that. I, if anything, I might have been envious. Well, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles is a, not a title one hears every day, and especially not back in the early 80s and uh, there were so many imitations you know then then you had adolescent alien yeah. mutant beavers you know and and on and on and on and we thought I think we thought is this stuff just being cranked out because it's crazy and it's a huge bandwagon that everybody's jumping on and you know what what is the substance of it you know Kevin and Beat easily care as much about the turtles as we care about ElfQuest it's it's their baby just like ElfQuest is ours 
but the imitators and the the flash in the pan stuff that came and went in the 80s we had our doubts like okay all of this is taking up shelf space and how do we compete and, and still stay true to uh, our vision of what's good storytelling and what uh, what matters to readers and how do we continue to build an audience for something more serious and heartfelt when all this crazy stuff is st is capturing everybody's attention. Well, see, this question gets into a whole other area, which I won't go into in depth, but all of the imitators of the Turtles in the mid-1980s created the bust. There was the black yeah. and white boom, which ElfQuest, I'm going to come out and say it, started because we were more successful than any other black and white title at the time. Mm -hmm. Up until 1984, we were selling 100,000 copies right off the presses at that time, and nothing succeeds like excess. Nobody tried to, to copy ElfQuest. There were some really funny kind of parody mags, but nobody tried to, to cash in on ElfQuest because it's just too no, individualistic, but the turtles... They couldn't figure out the formula. The so. turtles, all right, let's just have four characters, let's yeah. have this weird name that kind of sounds like Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, and we will coattail on the success. And there were so many of those, and so many other magazines, retailers thought, oh, turtles, those early issues are really valuable now retailers and speculators said all right we're gonna buy a hundred copies of this new title and that new title and this other new title and of course they weren't going to sell they weren't going to appreciate in value and that's why in 85 86 that bubble burst that we have never been a fan of that's just being lazy as far as we're concerned um, who have been your influences well, well it, it's widely known because we've said in infinite number of interviews that um, I'm a child of the East and the West. Um, I was first influenced by Jack Kirby. I discovered Marvel when I was a teenager and was immediately attracted to Jack's style. Very surreal, very cosmic, very strong, uh, strong structure. Uh, but then on the other hand, I had just begun to discover anime and manga, which, which was not widely known in America. And the drawing style there, particularly of Osamu Tezuka, who's considered to be the Walt Disney of Japan, uh, really spoke to me as an artist, spoke to, directly to my heart and soul. So on the one hand, I have my sensei Jack Kirby who taught me strength, structure, power in motion, action scenes, how to, how to pull off a really powerful action scene. On the other hand, I had Tezuka sensei who taught me the line of beauty and how to take a seemingly delicate character and put it through hell itself to create an incredible kind of tension because when you take a character that looks somewhat childlike, I mean, we're very used to it nowadays, the anime influence is everywhere in comics. Didn't used to be back then. But you take a delicate childlike looking character and then just put it through a samurai sword fight or a ninja attack or whatever, and you don't even know if this character is going to survive your protective instincts are triggered. So I, I could see that. And so those two elements went into ElfQuest. We, you have strong, sturdy st structure and design of the characters. And they are designed in such a way to invite your sympathy so that when we put them through hell, you will stay with it to see what happens to them. That was the formula, but nobody could figure it out back then. And from where I sit, nobody since has figured it out. <laughs> you take the, the mass and the power, excuse me, power of a Jack Kirby and the ethereal lightness and line of beauty of an Osama Tezuka 
and you put them together the way she has into a unique style, I can't think of anyone else. And we've been around a long time in comics, and everybody has wonderfully unique styles, but nothing that does what hers does. So why end it? Why end it? Well, if you're asking that question because we have just finished a few months ago the final issue of what is called Final Quest, <laughs> um, then you're asking the same question that we have been asked a lot more frantically by many fans. Oh no, why are you ending ElfQuest? And we take pains to say that we have wrapped up and concluded a 40-year story arc. We knew at the beginning where it was going. We knew how it was going to end. We have material that's 20 and 30 years old that points to where the final issue of Final Quest had to be by the time we got there. From the moment I told Richard the story in 1977, my basic story idea. We had the skeleton of the story all along and certainly over four decades we elaborated on that and took side trips and put the focus on other characters but ElfQuest is a hero's journey. The hero of the story is Cutter and this was his personal journey through the centuries to unite his people find out where they came from, find out what their place in the world, their chosen world is, and help others who wanted to leave go home. That was his quest. And he realized that, and the, the story arc played out, and it's a perfect ending place for the story. So, but, so. Cutter's arc is concluded, but there are many other characters at the end of Final Quest who have their own stories yet to be told, their own hero's journeys to complete. So we're very careful to say Final Quest is the conclusion of one story. Elf Quest does not end. Good. Um, how has your Comic Con experience been? Well, you mean this year? Yeah. Because we've attended practically every one. <laughs> no. Uh, this year has been extremely special because this is our 40th anniversary with ElfQuest. We just completed Final Quest and we have been on a, a year-long celebration and signing tour uh, internationally even. Uh, uh, it's, it has been a year of celebration for us and we knew Comic-Con would be the biggest and most special convention we would be attending because Really, when ElfQuest was born, we got started our, our, our first actual big exposure uh, to uh, this whole venue. Uh, was that Comic-Con? Was that Comic-Con. 1978 yes, Comic-Con. exactly. Was when we were able to see the results of our very, very first issue. And the fan response 40 years ago yeah. was incredible. The fan response this year is 10 times more gratifying and wonderful. We have been busier at this show than ever before. We have been doing interviews nonstop. We have been doing signings and we did a panel presentation, a celebratory uh, presentation uh, Saturday. Last night. Last night. Was it last night? Mm -hmm. I have lost all sense of time. We packed a large room. It was a celebration of completion and love and feedback and wonder. Um, I will go on record and say this is our best Comic-Con that we've yeah. ever been to. At the very least, it's our favorite. <laughs> Uh, and one final question for you, is there a question that you wish somebody would have asked you on this entire tour that you didn't? And if so, what's the answer to that? A question that we wish somebody would ask us that no one yet has. Yeah. I have the answer for you. 
Would you please accept this check for ten million dollars because I love ElfQuest so much? Question mark. And I think I know what my answer would be. I can't top that. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you guys so much. Thank you.